Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. Mm -hmm. And on behalf of my lovely wife, Alice, and myself, we want to... That's what I was going to say. <laughs> we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're continuing on. This is our uh, fourth part in our study of Conversations with Our Father, study of prayer. Amen. And uh, what we're doing, if you've been with us, we're doing a study from the, from the uh, Sermon on the Mount mm -hmm. in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus said, when you pray, pray in this way. So it's not that we're to pray those exact words necessarily, but that we are to pray in that manner. That's the model for our prayer. Absolutely. Right. So I, I pray that you've been able to see the previous uh, ones. This is, as I say, our fourth part. Mm -hmm. If you've not, they're there on BibleTalk.com, so you can you can go back and see them at any time. All of our Bible studies are available free on demand. But before we start now, I'm going to ask Alice if you will ask God's blessing on our time together. Absolutely. <clears throat> Father, we just praise you, we thank you, we bless you. And we ask you to guide and direct our hearts and our words mm -hmm. and our minds. <clears throat> to hear what you want us to hear, and to give us understanding that we can share this word with anyone we meet. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. <coughs> Sound like having a little tickle there. Yeah. Pray that the Lord just blesses you. Okay. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> All right, we are at that place in the, uh, in the prayer on the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So I want to start, and this, I want to read something. It's a bit of a long reading, but I, it's entirely necessary. Okay. I'm going to read from Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Mm. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what he was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed to him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Mm. This is incredibly serious business. Absolutely. I think this may be one of the most important segments of any study that we've done, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in these perilous last days, because it's about unity. You know, I, I think it was two weeks ago we talked about atomic-powered prayer that's based on the fusion that we have, being together with Jesus, made one with the Father, and being made one with each other, when we can pray in agreement. Satan does everything in his power to break that unity. Okay? What's the basis of this? What's the basis of this forgiveness? Well, let me tell you what John wrote in his first letter. Okay. In 1 John 4, 20 and 21, he said, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. 
And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Well, clear enough. (laughs) It is clear enough, and it certainly should be clear enough. But then if you have truly forgiven somebody, consider this. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, moved by the Holy Spirit, wrote to the church at Corinth and said, love is patient, Mm -hmm. love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. So if love does not take into account a wrong suffered, how can you not forgive somebody? Because you're holding that wrong, you're at least a perceived wrong, you're holding on to it and you're taking account of it and you won't let go of it. It's taking up space in your heart, which is less love of God there then. A- absolutely. Because if you don't, that's what I just, what mm-hmm. John said. If you don't love your brother who you can see, don't think that you love God who you can't see, right? right? And the other thing is, if you forgive somebody, you're so, you, you should really forget. It's, that's what Jesus does. That's yes, what God and does. We are, and we are going to talk about that because that's exactly the model of God our Father. Right. That, you know, spoken in Isaiah 43. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, right? But I want, you, I, I want you to perceive this. You know, I don't know how you approach Bible studies. But I want you to perceive this and start with this thing. This is, this is there was an old uh, television show when we were younger. There was, was a lot of old. Yeah. <laughs> and when we were younger, yeah. yeah. It was called Lost in Space. Oh, yeah. And there was a robot. And the robot was always saying, danger, danger, <laughs> danger. We need that robot right now. Because you need to hear the Spirit of God saying, danger, danger, danger. Jesus is teaching us to pray. Mm-hmm. Lord, don't forgive me any better than I forgive others. That's right. Whoa. I mean, that's clear. Those are, those are very strong words. But it's perfectly yes. clear. Yeah. Because he goes on in Matthew 6, 14 and 15 and says, "For if, this is Jesus speaking, mm-hmm. for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. How, how that, that should just grab you so, and, and make you examine and say, do I have anything? Am I, is there anybody I have not forgiven? And deal with it right away. What, in that verse uh, 15, he said he wouldn't forgive your transgressions <clears throat> if you don't forgive others. Right. So that means that if you don't forgive somebody, and, but you're sinning, not only with that, but other things, and you ask for repentance... You, you may run into a problem. Hey? Right, because he, he won't forgive you unless you forgive that person. That's what, it, that's what Jesus said, and it's clear as a bell. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to go and spend four years in a seminary to understand that verse. You shouldn't have to. I mean, it's perfectly clear. Because, uh, you know, this is, it's all through the teaching of Jesus. In the fifth chapter of Matthew, all right? In the fifth chapter, mm-hmm. starting in the 22nd verse, Jesus said, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Mm -hmm. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go to the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Yet you can't have a right relationship with God while you are in the midst of having a wrong relationship with your brothers. Right. For Jesus said, what, the le- what you've done to the least of my brothers, you've done unto me. Mm-hmm. Why do you think? Why do you honestly? Come on, take a minute and think. Why is there so much division in the body of Christ? It has everything to do with unforgiveness. Absolutely. And as I said, we talked, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the power, the most powerful thing on earth that we know is a fusion bomb, a nuclear, yes. a nuclear reaction. A fusion bomb is when, when atoms come together, pow, and unite, mm-hmm. and they actually create something new, right? Mm-hmm. Well, 
God has done that with us. We, we have been driven together by the power of God. That's, right. That's where that power, that atomic power of prayer comes from. As long as we are walking in unity. Listen, listen to God. I want I, I said, you know, we've been saying for the last three weeks, prayer is not so much about, you know, you go and talk to God and tell him what you want. Prayer is conversation with God, which means you have to hear from him. Mm -hmm. So listen to God. Psalm 86, 5 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. We are to be imitators of God as beloved children. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. So if that's God's attitude, ready to forgive, we need to be the same way because love does not take into account a wrong suffered, right? And what, what's the greatest prayer? Uh, you know, I'm talking about atomic prayer. The, the most powerful prayer ever prayed was Jesus Christ saying, Father, forgive them. Yes. You know, that one little prayer destroyed the kingdom of Satan. Mm -hmm. Destroyed it right then and there. Totally disarmed him. And had it not been for that one prayer, where would we be? Without hope is where we would be, right? And that's supposed to be what's in our heart. Think about Stephen. I mean, you know, Stephen in Acts chapter 6, he's, mm -hmm. he's picked uh, to, to wait on tables. And in Acts chapter 7, God is using him. And he is preaching what is probably the single most comprehensive teaching on mm -hmm. um, the people of God mm -hmm. in Acts chapter 7, for which the Jews hate him and persecute him and start and stone him to death. To death. <clears throat> but in, in Acts 7, 59 and 60, it says, they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. I wonder how powerful that prayer was. I'll tell you how powerful that prayer was. And you, you go, if you, ask the Lord if this is not so. There was there among those people who were putting Stephen to death. There was one who was not throwing the stones, but was so in approval of that stone throwing that death that he held the coats for people so that they could throw the stones even harder. His name was Saul of Tarsus. And I say, that this is the time, because he knew scriptures backwards and forwards, mm -hmm. but as yet he didn't know the word of God who had been walking through their midst. But he heard the love of God yes. for the first time. That was the most powerful sermon ever preached. Father, forgive them. Yes. Yeah. Don't hold this sin against them. And I, and I believe that message that Paul heard that day, Saul of Tarsus, bore fruit on the road to Damascus when he encountered Jesus Christ. You know, thank God, we don't have to beg our God for forgiveness. No. We only need to repent, and the sin is gone, and remembered no more. Like I'll say, right? In 1 John again, in 1 John, in the first chapter of the ninth verse, he said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, if somebody comes to you and asks for forgiveness, you should have, you should have at the readiness with great joy that willingness to forgive and be restored into a right relationship with him. Forgive them and forget what they've done. Right. Now that may be the real challenge, okay? But that's exactly what God said in Isaiah 43, 25. He said, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. That's right. Hallelujah. They're gone. They're, They're gone. gone. Thank God for that. I, I have to tell you. Back when I was younger and I was part of a, a, a religion, which I ha have now not been part of, I just had this, I didn't want to go to heaven. You say, what? Well, I had this fear of going to heaven because I had this, I had this vision that when we all get to heaven, it's like going to, you may not even know what a drive-in movie is now, but a drive-in movie where all of the people, <coughs> the, the myriads and myriads, are standing before this gigantic movie screen and everybody gets their turn and all the rotten things, all of the sins you've committed are there to be seen by everybody. Well, my mother would be in the crowd. You think I wanted her to see the thing? <laughs> really, honestly, I mean, that might sound silly, but it's not silly to me. Because, you know, when all is said and done, most of the sins we commit, we don't want anybody to know about. No, of course not. 
but There's God side of us that only God sees. Yes, yes, that's a, the dark the side of the moon. moon. Yeah. But God, in His magnificent, amazing grace, not only forgives our sin but forgets Him. Now, you know, I had somebody ask me the other day and says, "Well, how do you do that? How do you for, you know you can choose to forgive? Yes. How do you choose to forget? Because every per time that person comes to your mind." Well, I'll tell you what, what they've done to you is going to come to mind. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you, there really is a very simple way to deal with it. Every time that person that you have chosen to forgive, when, he come, when that person, male or female, young or old, when they come to mind and what they've done comes to mind, pray for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Bless them. Yes. Pray for them. Bless them. Isn't that what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12? If you, you know, God said, revenge is mine, saith the Lord. He'll deal with, with those things, all right, if they, if they remain unrepentant. But he said, we're not to deal with it. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to, to drink. We can overcome bad with our good, with us doing good. That's the plan. And if you pray for that person, how many times? Seven? Or as Peter said, 70 times seven? No, Jesus said that. You know, it's one more time. That's right. You got to forgive, you know, you can forgive and choose to forgive, but that doesn't necessarily take away the pain. But when you start to bless them, bless them with your prayers, every time you think of them, pray for them. Don't pray against them. Pray for them. Pray that they will come into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Because if they're in a right relationship with Jesus Christ, I promise you, they'll be in a right relationship with you. You know, I've heard so many people say that if they've been hurt by someone, they'll say, well, I forgive them. I just don't want to have, spend any time with them. I can, but I forgive them. Well, if it's a brother or sister in the Lord. They don't, want to, they don't want to fellowship with them anymore, but they forgive them. Well, then you better be careful because if you don't want to spend any more time with them, God will say, well, maybe, you know, they're coming up here. Maybe you better go down there. Mm -hmm. Since you don't want to be around them. Because if you've forgiven them, you'd want to be with them. Love does not take into and account and a wrong suffer. suffering. Yeah. Love is the perfect forgiveness. Love forgets. Yes. It may require a little work on your part. Yeah. But I'm telling you, the, the plan is there. Pray for them. Bless them. Do good to them. And I, your heart will change. Yes. See, this verse... You know, for, forgive us our debts, our trespasses, as, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us, our debtors. That's there to remind us about the forgiveness mm, of God yes, yes. and the challenge we have to forgive. Okay? It's not begging God for forgiveness because if we can go to him and call him Father, you know what? He's already forgiven us. Okay? We need to learn to have that same forgiveness in us. As I said, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Remember he said in Matthew 25, 40, Truly I say to you, inasmuch as you did this to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. This is so serious, so important, that going on right after this teaching on prayer, Jesus said that Jesus said this, talking about that danger, 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 right? The faithful steward issue. He talked about that. Whatever great gift you have received, what, God, I, we've been talking about this since forever mm -hmm. because this started with a, a teaching on the ministry of all believers. Mm -hmm. I said anything that God calls you to do, unlike Pharaoh in Egypt, who called the, the people of God to do something and failed to equip them to do it. Right. Anything that God calls you to do, he will equip you for. How can you possibly forgive people when they have done great harm to you easily? Because the love of God has been poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit. That's Romans 5, mm -hmm. 5. You have that, Paul, in another place, Paul says, you know, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's the treasure that you have, is the love of God. Jesus, 
You know, that you can say, Jesus looked at us and said, you know, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Well, we all knew what we were doing when we were sinning, except for the fact that we were just unconscious of God and his love, right? Now, consider this. The prophet Zephaniah, near the end of the Old Testament, in the first chapter, in the, uh, first chapter in the 12th verse, Zephaniah said, it will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem. This was the Lord. I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good or evil. Well, you know what it meant to be stagnant in spirit? You ever see, he's a living water. If you, you know, Alice and I, we've lived out in the bush in, the, in Central America. We've traveled in East Africa and West Africa. Water is precious in those places. Mm -hmm. But when you come along water and you see it's been sitting there and it's green and yucky and stagnant, Stinky. it's good for nothing, right? right? Well, think about, let me just put a picture in your mind here a minute. The Jordan River that flows north mm -hmm. to south. It flows down into Israel. It flows into the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is filled with life. That's why you read about fishing there all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Then it flows out of the Sea of Galilee and continues on down and goes into the Dead Sea and stops. Why do you think it's called dead? Because it stops. It doesn't flow any else. It doesn't flow. It doesn't go out. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in, interestingly, in the King James, it talks about those who rest on their lees. And I, I think... Um, Maybe we're not, I don't want to say, well, remember, don't take offense. We're not well enough educated by and large to understand some of those things mm -hmm. that are perfectly ex what God wanted to say. Yeah. If you understand, if you've ever seen a sailboat, if the sailboat is going, it has two sides based on the weather. There's a lee side and a windward side. Mm -hmm. The windward side is the side that the wind is coming from and that the sea is rougher over there because the wind's there. On the other side, because the, sh the boat is blocking the wind, it's calm, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's still. Right. It's in, not moving. It's not moving. In ancient Israel, when they made wine, one of the things that in the process of making the wine, you know, they would pour it into earthen vessels and it would sit there to ferment. But they would have to take it periodically and pour it from one vessel into another so it didn't get, I think, a crust kind of like on it. So in order for it to be good, they had to keep pouring it from vessel to vessel. And that's what God is talking about. If God has poured his love into your heart through the Holy Spirit, he expects you to take that love and pour it into the next person. Mm -hmm. And that person to pour it in. Christianity is supposed to be viral. People should catch it just being around us. That's a truth. The presence of God. <sighs> what the Lord has poured into you absolutely should flow out of you mm -hmm. and touch other lives. Let me just read that verse, five, Romans 5.5. 5. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You have that great treasure. Let it flow out from you. Let it touch other lives around you. People, when people see you not taking into account wrong suffering, when they see you praying for your enemies, as Jesus said, when you bless those who persecute you, you are so different in the world, people will take notice. And that's when they will want to know, why, why? How can you possibly love your enemy? <clears throat> you can, because the same love that empowered Jesus to love his enemies, us, is now in our hearts. No house divided can stand. That's, Jesus said that. A kingdom divided will fall, a house divided can't stand. There is so much division in the body of Christ, and so much of it comes from people taking offense, getting offended, getting hurt by somebody. Somebody said this about me, somebody did this, somebody didn't treat me right here. Well, you know what? We need to repent of that division. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. And we need to get back to that place where we are operating with the love of God, which leads us into the next part, and lead us not into temptation. Now, I don't think we're going to get into this too deeply, this session.
But I want to get started in just a little teaser. Mm-hmm. You know, Roman Catholic Pope, uh, Pope Francis, not, not long ago, suggested that this verse be changed. Yes. Now, you know, the scripture says, don't you go changing my word. Mm. But he suggested it should be changed because, after all, God doesn't lead us into temptation. Well, God does indeed not lead us into temptation, as we should be reminded every time we say this. It was like we talked about with give us this day our daily bread. <laughs> you know, you it's just, a, it, it, no, because it's, yeah. it's calling to mind the fact that he is the supplier of our daily bread, mm-hmm. not us. Right. Right? So that he won't lead us into temptation. So Pope Francis said, well, it's the devil, Satan, who leads you into temptation. I disagree. Mm-hmm. I disagree. Now, listen, I know that Satan is a trapper. I know that he is the one who goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, as, it, as Peter wrote, 1 Peter 5, 8. He sets traps for us. Right. And you know, any trap has to be set with bait, something that will attract you to yes. the trap, right? Mm-hmm. He wants to draw you to a snare, okay? He knows what bait to use because we're constantly telling him. If you're always talking about money, if you're always talking about that car, if you're always talking about this or that, he knows, oh, he knows what bait to use against you. But at the end of the day, when you stop and think about it, it's our flesh that leads us to the trap that he set. Mm -hmm. Our flesh, as Paul says, is in constant conflict with our spirit. In Galatians 5, 16 and 17, Paul said, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, Amen. so that you not, may not do the things that you please. It's our, it's our pride, it's our self. In the last days, perilous last days, men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It's those things that lead, that lead us over into the temptation. Mm-hmm. And then we take the bait and pow, there goes the the trap, right? And pride, as I said, pride is an incredibly, incredibly powerful bait. Yes. Because pride exists in great places in our flesh, Mm -hmm. okay? And it's insidious. It's always knocking on the door trying to get in. But remember, you know, I, this is Mark, Mark's not with us today, but one of his favorite verses yes. is Psalm 119, verse 165. Those who love thy law shall have great peace, and nothing shall offend them. Mm-hmm. Now, if, you, if people can't offend you, they can't hurt you. And, there, and you've got to remember, too, that your flesh will react. That's, that's just well, what it does. That's, but that's the flesh, yeah. which is in constant conflict with our spirit. And you have to overcome that. Yes, because your spirit is, should be saying to your flesh, your shut peace. Up. <laughs> oh, yeah, shut up. You know, you know, your flesh doesn't have to be uh, taught too nice. Get get tough with your with your flesh. That's right. Say, stop you silly. You don't need to take offense. You don't need to be concerned about people hurting you or killing you, because our God is a God who delivers us from the snare of the trapper, as it says in Psalm ninety one. Amen. Well, time flies. Do be back again next week because I really want to get into that and and we'll probably end up this prayer next week, maybe. (laughs) But these really are incredibly important topics because we need to know how to communicate with God our Father. Especially we need to know how to hear His voice because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word and without that faith, it's impossible to please Him. That's what we want to do. Amen. So Father, we just thank You for this time and Your Word. We thank you, Lord God, for your instruction. Yes. Lord, that you have words that train us in righteousness. We just praise you and thank you, Lord God, and help us truly to desire more and more and more to be imitators, followers of you, that people might see you in all that we do. In Jesus' name I ask, Father. Amen. 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 Till next time. Thank you.